All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks to everyone uh, for coming to this uh, seminar. Why in the world should I get a PhD in engineering? The seminar is being sponsored by the uh, Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies Office, uh, the School of Engineering here at Rice University, uh, and the Rice Center for Engineering Leadership, also known as RCEL. So essentially, we want to talk about why in the world should I get a PhD in engineering? This is a question that a lot of students who do undergrad research ask their advisors. Sometimes PhD students ask this question. And some PhD students are in this room, so they want a reminder, obviously. And, and so hopefully I can answer this question concisely uh, in under 40 minutes, hopefully uh, 30 minutes for you. And then at the end, we'll take some uh, questions and answer. So essentially, I am uh, Fred Higgs. I'm a professor here in mechanical engineering, and I also, also have a joint appointment in the bioengineering department. I'm also the faculty director of the Rice Center uh, for Engineering Leadership. And I wanted to just kind of go through some of my research. My lab is the particle flow in Tribology Lab. Tribology is essentially the study of interacting surfaces and the associated friction, lubrication, and wear. In particular, my lab, within that field likes the problem where there's interfaces and there's particles in between them. It turns out that's a very complex problem and you need a special set of skills to be able to solve it. You can imagine a place like Houston has a lot of rubbing surfaces where you're destroying things in order to make some money. And so at the bottom right here, you can see this is a drilling uh, simulator that we're getting in our lab here soon uh, where the drill bit will be able to carve into rock and measure rates of penetration and we create what's called a physics-based virtual twins of those same simulations. So in order to predict what's going on here, we create uh, physics-based simulations from the ground up. We code them up from the ground up. In the same way, uh, 3D printing, right? Most people, undergrads certainly, or here in the OEDK, uh, they think about plastic printers. But in actuality, the holy grail of 3D printing is metal printing, solving that. And those are powder-based printers, and they're, they're hundreds of thousands of dollars. So, and we're getting one of these in our lab, but the powder, you need to be able to understand its behavior and how you spread it. So basically, uh, you have a CAD file, you put down a layer of powder, and you selectively bind the powder and make it solid at the places where the CAD file says you're building something. So you need to understand how powder is spread, and so we have powderiometers to be able to do that. Here's a physical setup of a powderiometer. You see this test uh, running here. And we also run simulations of this same thing. Uh, we do spreading simulations as well. Uh, everything is about virtual simulating physical systems in order to get predictive knowledge of that. So each PhD in my lab does experiments and modeling to be able to do that. And we are across several departments there. We study artificial hip joints. Anywhere there's rubbing surfaces, we love that problem. So I want to get right into it, why you really came here. Uh, the first slide was just to show you that I actually have a PhD and I'm training students to get a PhD. Um, but there are five myths, I think, that students think about the PhD. And we want to address them head on. Uh, the first one is that the PhD frequently renders you overqualified. I always hear uh, that one. The second one, is that the PhD limits uh, your career paths. I'm not sure why the type of student. The next one is that the PhD is useless in entrepreneurship uh, and business. And then uh, PhDs are underpaid. And finally, the PhD is only for becoming a professor. So this first one here, I just want to kind of march through each one. Uh, the PhD is overqualified. What I did was I did a survey, and I, and I crowdsourced uh, PhDs across the nation, uh, in a short amount of time, use Twitter, basically. Uh, and I got a response from like 60 plus PhDs in engineering, which is very difficult to do. Uh, and here's the first question I ask. As a PhD in engineering, how often have you missed out on an opportunity due to being overqualified? And never got a, over 80%. Once or twice, got about 17%. And often, right? One person said that. So if anybody ever tells you a PhD is overqualified, and you will hear it, it normally happens at an internship, I'm going to tell you that that person will 
almost always not have a PhD. Right? So it's a bit of a conflict of interest in making that point. And the actual engineer PhDs, the data doesn't bear out that that's actually true. So this is indeed a myth that the PhD frequently renders you overqualified. The next one, the PhD limits your uh, career path uh, there. And we want to definitely look at that one. The same uh, survey uh, was asked. And I asked this question here. What would you tell an undergrad student is the greatest benefit to getting a PhD in engineering or computer science? I'm not going to give you all the results at this point, but I will tell you that the, when I put a histogram together and look at the biggest frequency of answers, the theme that came up was the, this one, career flexibility. Right? That's the number one rank uh, benefit that came back to me in this survey for a reason to get a PhD in engineering. So that combats this myth that it limits your career path because the number one response, without them knowing why I was asking for the survey, the number one response that came back was career flexibility. We'll dig into that a little bit later. The next myth, the PhD is useless in entrepreneurship and business. Uh, this is Jack Welch. He's generally considered the standard in business. He's retired now. He's the CEO of GE, and he took them to be the big conglomerate that they are. No harder core company in terms of uh, engineering and technology. He's actually a PhD uh, in chemical engineering. And I just kind of show these kind of snapshots. He's on CNBC or MSNBC, constantly talking about a business. This is him since he's retired. So you probably see him a lot there. He has his own little university. He writes business books. Uh, Fortune, when they put out articles on Global 500, they say things like Walter's rules. Uh, for winning, don't work anymore. My point is that he's the benchmark standard for business, and this is a PhD in, in chemical engineering. So uh, you might want to think about that. Uh, this is Louis Von Ahn, one of my former uh, colleagues, and he's an interesting guy. He's a, a professor of computer science, and he made this thing called recaptures. What are recaptures? Is this stuff. The squiggly things, remember? What do you use this? When you go to Google or Facebook, it wants to authenticate that you're a human, right? Everybody's nodding their head. Now, I want to skip ahead, then I want to come back and tell you about captures, right? So he's, the number of companies he started that were acquired by Google are two, all right? My question is, how does he make money from recaptures? Anybody wants to try to take a guess? What do you say? What do you say? Yeah, right. So you log in, and people pay for that, right? The Google or whatever will pay for that. Not actually. The problem with that is, is that you motivate Google and Facebook to come up with their own way of, of doing logins so they don't have to pay that contract to you. Right? So in steady state, they're going to eliminate you. So he doesn't charge them. He doesn't charge them. So this is what actually happens. So captures was the original thing. Recaptures is where he makes the money. So basically, get ready for it. You are the processors. He's one of the pioneers of a field called human computing. So. He goes to like newspaper companies, like the New York Times, and he says that I'll digitize all of your old newspapers, not just your new ones. Like way back to like 1850 something. I'll digitize all of them. What? How you gonna do that? They wrinkled up, we got them in the back shelf, bring them in, scan them, and then the words look like this. Squiggly. No computer can figure that out. So you go in and you type this to get into Google and you're computing, right? You're figuring out what they're saying. And he's digitizing it over time to the point where now that he does uh, 40 million words a day, right? And he's already digitized the complete New York Times. And Google Books, of course, are using him to digitize that. So when you think you're logging into Facebook, you're actually translating for this. And so he has all of this information. He's able to help him do that. 
Now, we see a lot of accolades like Genius and Fellowship Award, but the point is that that level of innovation doesn't happen unless you're, uh, you're pursuing a PhD. Those type of companies that are, won't happen in that case. So the PhD is, is more than just, uh, it's, it's not useless in entrepreneurship and business. You can do high level things that are super innovative. So the next myth is that uh, engineer PhDs are underpaid, right? So I pulled some salaries here, and uh, it's from one of our peer institutions. Uh, and so they basically have the salaries for the different engineering majors. This is the median PhD salary, right, for each of these uh, majors, and uh, then the median BS uh, salary. Uh, here. So uh, you can see that's a little bit of a step jump coming out for a new student uh, getting a, uh, a PhD uh, in engineering. There. I also pulled this. This is uh, salaries. This is kind of a old data. I can assure you that it's much higher now because I know this university, but the data wasn't available. This is just a state university. And what I want to just provide is kind of a progression on what would happen to say one enterprise like academia. Uh, the president gets paid um, a pretty good amount and then it scales down all the way to like a new professor, someone coming out with a PhD uh, there. Down to a postdoc and a PhD student, right? So we'll talk later about uh, what PhD students let you see walking around, you know, what's special about that number. Um, but they basically get a stipend to do their work, right? That's what a PhD gets and that's and that's their other salary. Now, this doesn't include consulting, right? So now, the PhD is interesting because you become an expert of something specific. So when they come to you, you can pretty much write your own ticket. So for example, I had a company to come to me and say, uh, uh, we're, there's a big company being sued, and it's in chemical mechanical polishing, and we want you to we know you do experiments and modeling in this, and we, need, and we know you're a professor, so you can explain things on the witness stand. So we need you to look and see if this is true, right? So naturally, I charged them $500 an hour because they came aligned with my specialty, right? They can't find anybody else who could do that so well. And so um, what I ended up doing was going through the literature and just kind of piecing together, oh, look, they said they didn't know about it, but here they said this in this report. Um, here, I was like CSI. It was very exciting. I'm um, working on that. And made you know, a lot of money, short amount of time. And you would think that you say, wait a minute, you just did a literature survey, right? But the problem is that I know the entire field, so I have complete confidence in what I'm looking at, even though I'm just doing a literature survey. So you don't have to have a PhD to do a literature survey, but you wonder, like, did I miss something, right? But you have deep expertise, you don't have that issue on there. Uh, this is the next myth. The PhD uh, is only for becoming a professor. Uh, so that's not necessarily true. You saw some other examples. But either way, that's huge, becoming a professor. I just I want to tell you that right now. Uh, so I mean, you have complete autonomy. I mean, you have something called tenure if you make it there, which means they can't fire you unless you do something extremely egregious um, there. Um, but you can pursue whatever comes to your mind. Like, uh, this is one of my colleagues here, uh, uh, Rebecca over in bioengineering. And basically she said, I want to change the world. I want to go and, and create the technologies here, but port them to developing countries that need it. And so she was able to write grants, People gave her millions of dollars to work on her dream, right? And so she had these initiatives like Rice 360 Degrees, um, Beyond Traditional Borders. She just sent me this uh, latest picture here um, where they're putting technology that's helping uh, babies, eliminating a certain hardship conditions. She's always in Malawi. Um, she still teaches, but she's always in Malawi, right? She's never paying for it out of her own pocket. Uh, so you say, wait a minute, I, don't, I could do that if I don't get a PhD. I would challenge you on that. Uh, what innovation are you going to come up with to be able to do that? If you're smart enough to come up with it, you got to convince people a lot. You have to put a lot of energy to convince them that 
your technology works because you don't have your PhD um, to do that. And no one's going to give you money to just kind of fly over the world pursuing your dreams because they need to trust you and they think that you need to have a badge. The badge is the PhD. I'm there. So here's a friend of mine, uh, Bicey, who's at uh, uh, Johns Hopkins, Bicey Bell. Uh, she actually uh, works on a lot of interesting things in her Pulse Lab, uh, photo, acoustic, and ultrasonic systems in the engineering lab. But the main takeaway here is that uh, when she was an undergrad, uh, she actually, uh, her mother died of breast cancer, and she felt that it could have been thwarted had it been diagnosed earlier. And so she felt the ultrasonic, uh, the ultrasounds were insufficient. So she vowed to stop that. And so she's working on technology that creates clear, uh, clearer imaging uh, to spot cancer earlier. She's recently been in MIT's uh, top 35 people under the age of 35. So, you know, having that badge, she can say that, you know, I'll bring technology fully to bear and all of my training to solve these really big problems, right? And then she could actually write people to give her money to do it. You just cannot do that without a PhD. You can't say, give me millions of dollars because I want to solve this. Maybe there's an outlier of people who can do that, but they are such a minuscule amount, it's not statistically realistic. So she's essentially a superhero to avenge an important event in her life. Oh, here. So here are the survey results. Here's the question I asked. Um, what would you tell an undergraduate engineering student is the greatest benefit to getting an engineering degree? And you can see here in terms of uh, frequency, which ones came up? Career flexibility was first. Uh, VIP card to inaccessible opportunities. So basically, once you get this PhD, right, there's a, there's a group of people who uh, are on your committee. Only they in the world kind of understand what you're doing, but they don't understand it fully uh, when you're getting your PhD. Your PhD advisor understands the most of it. But by the time you're graduating, he or she does not understand everything. So, but they are enough to follow you down this pathway to, to stamp you at the end, give you this VIP card saying that you understand what you're doing. So, uh, so once you have that card, then you can say, I, I want to change the world. I don't like this light. I want to get into lighting, right? And you can totally do that and write for hundreds of thousands of dollars to do that um, there. Uh, it's an expert card, right? People say you're an expert, right? They, you have to get a lot of years of experience without a PhD to say you're an expert. The minute you graduate from your PhD, you are an expert, right? And so you can go around and, and say that. Uh, deep learning, I got a lot of good responses from people, and I'm actually gonna put this data um, online, uh, but a lot of good responses from people uh, are from deep learning. So the ability to go in to the edge of knowledge, and I'll talk about that in a minute to the edge of knowledge and beyond your textbook. You simply won't do that uh, without a, a PhD. Uh, you, challenge to expand your knowledge daily. You know, one of the caveats I'll give is that you know, I'm not belittling any other major uh, here. I'm just talking about engineering, and I'm here to give a convincing argument for the PhD in engineering for those who are thinking about it or have the mindset to think about it. In other words, I'm just trying to make engineering great again. No, I'm joking. <laughs> but the, uh, so essentially here, uh, the challenge to expand knowledge daily, when you go on a job as a regular engineer, uh, you'll get your assignment, and you'll work on that for a long time until you move on. But you're not going to be able to say, hey, there's a new path. We can innovate and go down this path. I'm sorry, we don't know we trust what you're saying. Give your ideas to the PhDs in the research lab, let them run with it, and then they'll come back and tell you if it's a good idea, um, right? So you're constantly challenged because you're at the edge of knowledge. PhDs are constantly creating new knowledge. We're not constantly applying what's in the textbook. You deal with the textbook in your first year to pass the qualifier exam, then after that, you're in the edge of knowledge, inventing new things. You're creating knowledge. You can create knowledge if you uh, have some other uh, degree, but no one's going to say that you have the VIP card to accept that knowledge that's created. They're going to make it get validated by a PhD. Uh, it's important to research, maximum impact, freedom. That's a, a huge one uh, here. Freedom turns out to be important. So I want to show this slide of one of my colleagues, uh, Jim Tour. Now, some might say I'm cheating a little bit because he's a famous uh, chemistry professor. But Jim has uh, numerous appointments. 
in the School of Engineering because he takes chemistry and then he makes stuff. You know, he makes physical things. So Jim is a really sharp guy, one of the uh, big time players in nanotechnology. Uh, we, this guy has 600 research publications, over 120 patents, was Scientist of the Year by R&D Magazine, very prestigious magazine. Uh, but he's pursuing whatever he wants to do, right? Any idea that comes to his mind, if he gets money for it, he can get other people to follow him and do it. If he doesn't get money, he can still work on it. And he has tenure, nobody will say anything to him, as long as he shows up for organic chemistry on uh, Tuesday morning. Uh, but Jim has 120 patents to his name. You just really don't see that number normally, unless you know m maybe you're at a company, but even then, the ones that are getting those patents, that many, they got a PhD. I'm just saying. This is what is, what is true. So his research areas like nanoelectronics, carbon research for oil, for oil and gas, uh, molecular machines. If you go to his website, uh, you'll see he's talking about these nano machines where he has molecules and he assembles them into a car and then he brings a field that makes them collide. I mean, crazy stuff, right? At the edge of uh, knowledge here. And then he can say, and now I'm going to go in and try to thwart uh, terrorist attacks here. Uh, then you look, he said, I want to do uh, science, technology, engineering, and math uh, types of projects for kids. He can get hundreds of thousands of dollars to do that um, as well. So uh, he can go anywhere he wants to go uh, with that uh, PhD. So now, here's your timeline. As I begin to wrap it up, your timeline is like this, right? All of us were here. And we, we did well here for the sole purpose of making it to here, right? I mean, that's what all that was about. The punchline was an application to grad school, and we got into to these different schools, like Rice, the major in engineering. Now you're an undergrad. Well, you're an undergrad now, and you're going to be there about you know, four years. Some schools could be five years. Um, and uh, after that, you're going to say, well, should I go in and get a master's degree? The master's degree is a fraction of that amount of time. Now, at the end of the master's degree, you get into a bit of a of a quandary where you're trying to figure out, should I uh, move on and, and go for more education? So should I do the doctorate? It normally happens at, at this point. Sometimes it's here because you can do a direct PhD program. But you wonder about that. And I say that, you know, you think it's like a big decision, but if you look at it with that scale for the rest of your life, then your decision here is going to determine your level of comfort for all this time here. So really, that's not that big of a, a decision. Uh, because you don't have anything to do until you die anyway. So you may as well make the decision now to just go this little bit amount of time here, right, is a small fraction in the rest of this uh, time here. So it's not much of a decision point uh, here, I would say. So if you think that there's something for you, then don't let the timeline be um, a part of that. Now, I do want to say, just looking at that timeline, Essentially, when you're an undergrad, this is, this is kind of the, the crux of a PhD, right? So when you're an undergrad, say in mechanical engineering, you take a course like this, engineering thermodynamics, right? Uh, and that's at the beginning of your mechanical engineering degree. Then at the end of this undergraduate period, you take a course called heat transfer. So if you look at the table of contents for this book, one of the chapters is dedicated to heat transfer, right? So here it's very broad, all energy, uh, you know, work and heat, and the different types of heat transfer. Just a big first law of thermodynamics that equates all these energies together and the limitations on engineering systems that have them. Well, now you get advanced in undergrad, and they say, well, now we're just going to focus on the Q. So the Q was in that first law of thermodynamics for heat, but now it's a complete course in heat transfer. You go to graduate school to a master's degree, you can take a course like I did called convection heat transfer or conduction heat transfer. One of the three types of major modes of heat transfer that you heard about in uh, this class. So a complete class in one chapter of this book um, there. Well, when you get your uh, PhD uh, here, you, you do something like this, write a paper just on the limitations to the thermal conductivity, which is like one part of one sentence in this book. They may say, hey, just so you know, the thermal conductivity is important, but there's a limitation to it. 
Right? You write an entire paper on it for your PhD. So I mean, you can imagine, right? Like, you're now an expert of this, but man, if, if there's a company that comes in line with that, we need your help. That'll be $500 an hour, so, right? Uh, because you cannot go anywhere else. I'm an expert in this. I'm there. So uh, that's what it uh, kind of commands that. So a few takeaways I'll give here. Uh, delayed gratification. Uh, if you look at studies on emotional intelligence, I won't get into them here, but uh, there's something called the marshmallow challenge. And this is an interesting challenge. I have kids now. Uh, I have kids that are uh, age six. I have three kids ages six and under. So I've been meaning to do this on my six-year-old. Uh, back in the 1960s, a famous marshmallow challenge, they took six-year-olds and they put them in a room and they gave them one marshmallow. They said, I'm going to leave for 10 or 15 minutes and if you don't eat this marshmallow, when I come back, I'm going to give you two marshmallows. But, you know, if you don't want to wait, then you can just eat the marshmallow. So they went behind a two-way, a one-way glass and was looking at the child. Some of them uh, would look at it and try to distract themselves, like look up and try to play with their hands. You know, some of them would try to fall asleep uh, to keep from eating the marshmallow, but some of them would eat it right away. Now, when they tried these same kids, 12 years later, graduated from high school, they found out that the ones that weighed the longest had up to like 200 points higher on the SAT score than the ones who didn't. Um, and so it turns out that uh, it was delayed gratification, the ability to hold out. Um, and so it's the same thing with that decision that you'll make at the end of your bachelor's degree, that you'll hold out a bit. It'll continue to be the number one predictor of how successful you'll be. Now, let me ask you a question. You, you might know these guys, but why are these guys pay so much? Anybody know why these guys pay so much? I mean, millions of dollars, why? They're just like putting the ball in a hoop or just throwing a piece of leather. <laughs> throwing a piece of leather is like millions of dollars a year. That's crazy. Why is that? Why are they getting paid so much? They get, but you could be a PhD and get what you do. You don't get all that. You could be an a, a engineer, a, a business person, you get what you do. You don't get all that. Why do they get paid millions a year? What do you say? But you can be the best business guy. Well, maybe you would get paid more if you're the best business guy. Because <laughs> they own those teams, right? <laughs> yeah. But, but I want to I wanna piggyback on that. It's simple. It's really simple. Right? Is this, supply and demand. Right? So you comb the earth. You cannot find another guy who is big as him, as fast as him, who can throw the ball that accurately for 60 yards. You cannot find it, right? You cannot find another guy who's 6'9", who runs like a 4'3", who can dribble a basketball, even if you're like five feet, you can't get it from him, right? And he can put it in the hoop, that little bitty hoop from way out, you know, 20, 30 feet. You cannot, you can comb the earth, you cannot find another. Right? So then, it's just like when there's too much fruit here, right? If it's too much of something, what happens? The price drops, right? Because it's oversupply. That's right? So, and if it's, a, uh, if it's a low supply of something, you gotta pay a lot, right? So, it's simple as supply and demand. Uh, here, I won't get into the price in particular, but you understand it, right? If it's less of something, they always pay more. So, you guys are right. I was just hitting on the, the athletes and what, you, and what you're saying, that you become rare at something, it will be in demand. Certainly if it's something that people want. If you're rare at it, the more rare you are, is there. And the implications for everything, it's implications for uh, the engineering PhD in America, if, it's, uh, if you're an American, right? There are benefits to that because certain places here, uh, like defense, they want you to be a citizen. I'm there. If you're an underrepresented minority, there's opportunities there. Or a woman, they don't exist much in engineering, uh, so there's opportunities if you're there. So it's a constant equation. Uh, then compared to the rest of the population, just anybody getting an engineering PhD, you're like the, a rare percentile there. So it's just like getting drafted. Let me tell you another one. The PhD is almost always free, right? It's very rare. Like I don't think I don't know any. Uh, domestic students that are paying for a PhD. I almost don't know anybody in the world who's getting a US PhD that's paying for it um, in engineering. In engineering that is. So it's almost always free. So keep that in mind. Um, here, there's a lot of fellowships, 
But even beyond that, right, your advisor, right? Anybody that comes in my lab, I, I pay you full, right? I pay for your tuition, then I pay your stipend, you already saw how much that is, so you can live and go and do nice things uh, there, but it's free, right? So let that, let that be known to you, right? So consider pursuing it I'm there. So in a nutshell, that's my argument for if you're a PhD student engineer, you got this curiosity, or you think you're sharp, or even if you want to just like prove yourself, like differentiate yourself from the mass, masses, you should consider getting a PhD in engineering. Thank you. All right, so if there are any uh, questions now, we're going to speak in the microphone because this is being videotaped. Um, so, uh, my question is, you, speci you, speci you specified engineering PhD. Is there any difference um, between the skill set or um, the skills and the knowledge um, of an engineering PhD and the science PhD? That's a good question. Well, I mean, so I did show one scientist, Jim Tour, uh, in this one. So he's going to be doing just as well, but he dabbles in both areas. But I can't speak much on the science uh, PhD. Everything I said that's about the PhD in general, everything except salaries, um, it does apply pretty much to the uh, science PhD um, there, from my knowledge of friends that have the PhD. But my argument, just to be clear, is to the engineering student or to the student who wants to get an engineer PhD. My arguments were, were there. But the science student who is here that also wants to get a PhD, I would say most of the presentations related to that. I would tell you to run it by some of your uh, advisors in science to make sure of that. But definitely the computer scientist uh, and the, uh, the person in engineering, that's who it's related to. But good question. Oh, thank you. My question is, I, don't, I wonder if you have the data, like how many percent of those PhD students didn't choose to go to academia and go to industry world afterwards? Like, because the reason why I brought up, brought up this question, because a lot of people ask, you know, you can spend five years, six years after your undergrad, to get your undergrad de degree to get a PhD, or you can spend these six or five years in industry work. By the time you have more experience, so you still can learn some stuff in, you know, you know, in the industry instead of in the school. So what do you think about this? All right, good, good question. So you had a two-part question. So I don't know specifically uh, the, the stats on, but for PhDs, most of them do go into industry. Uh, so I thought that's where you're going, but then you, you changed to contrasting bachelors with PhDs. So, I mean, yeah, you're, you're getting more experience uh, as in, if you come out with your undergrad degree, you're working in engineering while you're working on your PhD. But, I mean, it's, it's totally different, right? I mean, you're getting experience in something uh, with the bachelors, but you're not, like, going and innovating. They're not going to let you do that. That's locked to the R&Ds, the, the PhDs were there. And the, the actual PhD, when they finish, they're an expert. In that same amount of time, the bachelor's degree person is not going to be called an expert. But once you come in, you come in with a VIP card um, there. So you can do anything you want. You can go to that company where your friend uh, is working, right? And you'll say, hey, it's good to see you. Let's get lunch. But I got to go back to the R&D lab or something. Or I'm going to be in your group. But I'm going to be sitting back like this as an advisor. Well, you guys have some good ideas. Let me think about it. I'll get back to you in a week, but I'm going to Malawi <laughs> until then. I'm there. So, so, I mean, the access that you have is just different. There's like a, a ceiling on your head. I mean, certainly there are outliers there, but you just, I mean, how, if you have a bachelor's degree in engineering, which I do, I mean, how would I convince somebody that, uh, you know, we got one comment from the survey that I thought was poignant. They said, um, when there is a good technology and, the, and, and you want to say it's good, I can go in and prove that it's good. You can't do that with an undergrad degree. If I tell you, hey, this is it's a new device, it's going to change everything for energy, it's a wrap. You don't know what to do to, to prove that's true. Right? If, I, if it does a basic demonstration, right, just does something highly efficient, you don't know what to do. You'll get your undergrad book and maybe you have some experience, but you have no idea what studies that you start to prove that this thing is actually the best energy device that we have. You're not trained to even know where to 
start that question. You, you can't even think deep enough unless you put in 10,000 hours on that particular topic, right? Malcolm Gladwell did a study where he said, expertise comes after 10,000 hours on the topic, which he said mathematically actually amounts to a PhD. So yes, you could be a bachelor's student focus on a single topic for 10,000 hours and become an expert, a goodwill hunting, if you'll say. But at the end of that, you leave that company, why they, how are you gonna tell them you have that? Right? How are you gonna explain that? Trust me, I did it. Everybody will tell you. I mean, you have no VIP card to even explain that. Um, and then, why did you spend all that time on that one topic? Go get a PhD. <laughs> so you could have done other things with your time. So that would be my only thing there. So there's a lot of exciting things you could do with your bachelor's degree in engineering, but it is a different ball game um, with the PhD in engineering. Good question. Oh, I'll start up here since the microphone is up there. And then, Joy, you can make your way down here. Cool. So it seems like a lot of PhD go to do starting up after they get a degree, like the one uh, of like recapture mentioned in the lecture. Also, meanwhile, there's a lot of like undergrads going to starting up. So like, what's the difference between like getting PhD and start your own business, or like just start your own business after graduation in undergrad school? All right. Thank you. <laughs> that's that's a good question. So first of all, you. You can start your own business and drop out of here, right, right now. We've seen that, right? Uh, and we've seen that with, say, Zuckerberg dropped out right, of undergrad, computer science. The Google guys dropped out of PhD programs. Zuckerberg, Facebook, you know the story. He was sued because they said, you took my idea. He, yeah, because he's operating in a realm in which he had, a, he had an idea off of someone's idea. Google guys, there's no one saying that. You can't even reproduce what they're doing, right? Because they're using the innovation from their PhD studies to create it. I mean, who thinks of that? We think we're going to uh, have the whole world on the computer. We're going to take everybody's web page and put it on a computer. What? Who's going to do that? We'll just buy up land, and we'll have the fastest way to go and access it. I mean, who thinks of that, right? So they're radically different. But both of them can start a company. The, the Zuckerbergs are statistically more statistically unlikely to be able to do that well in engineering than the PhD. Now, but even, so, but they exist all the time. People don't get a PhD in engineering, or they get a master's in engineering, and they start companies. But, you know, I have a startup company, but it's interesting now, we have, a, we're in phase one uh, of funding for our company, a, a small business innovative research grant, right? It's a bioenergy company. And we've turned down over a million dollars because we think it's like more hype, right? People want to fund us because they're like, oh, you're an engineer from Rice, right? You know, you're an engineer from you know, this university. So, an uh, engineer PhD from this university. So we know what you're saying is true. But we think, ah, we haven't proven something, so we don't want to hurt our names. So we have the opportunity to, you know, look down on the venture capital funding. You won't be able to do that with your bachelor's degree. So you, you better start something where you have your own funding or you have to put in a lot of energy to you know, come to the you know, Rice Business Plan competition or something to convince them. Once you have the PhD, if you have a business acumen, then it's like, well, interesting, right? I can get on the Shark Tank with my idea. Why is a PhD in engineer coming on here? Let's get him on here and see what he's, we'll see what he's up to, right? It's, it's more likely that I can get on. In my mind, I don't think it's a barrier to get on Shark Tank to talk to VCs. It's, if you're an undergrad engineering degree, you think, I hope I get on Shark Tank, you know, statistically. They say it's my big one, right? So they can both get there, but the statistics are different. One is like you're an outlier, and the other is it's accessible to you with that VIP card. So what is the time scale of getting a PhD versus a Master's of Science in Engineering, and what is the additional benefit you get for that PhD over that Master's of Science, and I guess even that Master's of Science over just a Bachelor of Engineering? Yeah. Oh, so that's good. So, so you ask for a double contrast. So you're right. So you get your bachelor's degree typically in, say, uh, four years, you know, maybe five years, depending on the university. Uh, and then you do another two years, typically, for a master's degree. And then you do another three years, sometimes four, uh, after the master's for a PhD, right? So the students in my lab are typically um, two for the master's and then three um, for the uh, PhD. So it's just like a five-year um, beyond the bachelor's degree um, where you're getting that. And for the master's degree uh, there, 
you could come, you, first of all, you'll command a higher salary than the bachelor um, there. And you'll be able to, you're, you're somebody who can do actual engineering. I mean, a lot of times in undergrad engineering degrees in the industry, they'll take you into project management, right? Because you, you apply the techniques of that company. But otherwise, if you want to start moving around, I mean, you have to pretty much go into project management. The master's degree certainly could do that, but they have deeper insight so that they could actually say, I want to stay on the technical track. I'm there. The PhD could do all of those things, right? But they could also say, I want to go into R&D. I want to lead a research team. I think there's an idea. Give me $1 million in one year, and I can create new revenue for this company. The PhD pretty much has to go and say that. A master's degree with a lot of credibility can sit you know, 10, 20 years there. They're effectively like a PhD um, if they worked in this one area. And so they'll have that credibility if their peers say it. But they'll be underpaid because they didn't have the PhD. So like, what's the, why leave that, why leave that money on the table um, there? So, but then that PhD could say, you know, gets married or something, and, and her husband moves to some area to, of Nebraska, and there's no engineering company. She could say, well, I want to go to the University of Nebraska and teach um, there. I'm going down that career track. And while I'm there, I want to uh, save South Carolina. Right? So I'm going to have research dedicated to that. And you can write grants to get money to do that. You don't have those avenues with those other two to be able to do that. It's a good question. Any more questions? All right, so well, thank you. Hopefully, uh, we'll see a lot more applications for those who want to get uh, a PhD in engineering. Uh, the, we'll have links for the uh, presentation. And the actual data is pretty awesome from the uh, PhD survey, and it's still coming in. So what they said is so special about the PhD, we're going to make that available online. The link will be uh, at the end of the uh, slideshow when it's posted online. And you can access that data, see all the anecdotal information yourself. Thank you.